Hello, everyone, and welcome back once again. You're watching the PLZ Forum for Ecozoic Era 2020. We're broadcasting live from Seoul, Korea, and the time is a little bit after lunchtime, 1 p.m. Following the special session from early on today, we have another special session. This one is organized by Center for Asian Urban Societies, also known by the abbreviation CAUSE. And I would like to introduce to you the moderator, Heran Shin, a professor at Seoul National University. We also have four presenters, Ji Yu Su, Distinguished Professor of Department of Geography at National Taiwan University. We also have Takashi Yamazaki, Professor of Department of Geography at Osaka City University, Japan. We also have Singok Lee, Assistant Professor of S School of Humanities at Social Science at KAIST, Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. Last, we have Pegin Park, Professor of <coughs> Seoul National University, and also the Director of Center for Asian Urban Societies. Are you ready, Professor Shin? Are you there? Yes, I'm ready. We're all ready to hear you. All right, uh, welcome to the Development, Environment, and Peace Nexus, Peacemaking in Borderlands. And uh, this session is uh, on the local and the subnational perspectives on sustainable and peaceful development in the East Asian borderlands. Uh, I am the moderator in this session, um, and my name is Heran Shin. Well, this conference is organized by UNRISD and the People for Earth, with the support from Gangwon Provincial Government and the Cheolon County Government of the Republic of Korea. Uh, well, in this session, we would like to address peacemaking in the East Asian border regions based on the uh, geopolitical economy perspectives. Well, today uh, I'm joined here by a fantastic group of panelists who will share some of their insights, reflections, and leave the experiences with us. After their initial round of presentations, well, each presentation will be probably uh, around 15 minutes, and we will have uh, some time for questions and answers. Uh, but before we start, let me uh, make uh, some brief announcement. Um, this session will be recorded and then live streamed via the YouTube channel, where it will remain available afterwards. You can also find the recordings of past sessions there in case you missed them. You will see that we have enabled the comments sections on the YouTube live channel. So please use the comments section for questions you would like to pose directly to, uh, to the speakers and put any general comments or information you would like to share into the comments section. And for the questions and the comments, put into the uh, comments section, you can use likes to indicate your support for the questions or comments. It will help us identify those questions and comments that, that most people would like to see addressed. And the, uh, at the very end of the session, we will uh, also share a link to a concise three questions feedback survey. So we would greatly appreciate if you could fill that in. All right, now uh, let me go to the, um, uh, the first, uh, first presentation. The first speaker is uh, Jin Yu Xu from National Taiwan University. And uh, his title is Geopolitics and Development, the Border Work of Kimen and Machu Islands in the Cross Strait Relation. Jin Yu, please. Thank you. Thank you, Heron. Uh, and, uh... I take this chance to uh, express, express my gratitude to the conference organizer to invite me to join this terrific conference. Okay, uh, here I uh, my case study. I will present a, ca a case case study about the uh, Gimem and Maju. That's the offshore island. It's border region uh, in the cross strait uh, between Taiwan and uh, mainland China. So. Uh, Here's the uh, presentation outline of, uh, in the beginning, I will talk about a, a very brief 
a series of all the work. And then I will go through the, the, the evolution, uh, the, the evolution of the uh, Kinmen and Island, uh, and uh, Kinmen and the uh, Mazu Island in the cross trade uh, uh, exchange uh, in the past uh, three decades. And then I will give a conclusion. Okay, so uh, uh, first, first of all, I, I will focus, uh, my paper will talk about the, con you use the concept of uh, so-called border work. Uh, basically because uh, recent uh, research researchers, they, they try to, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, okay. They, uh, re uh, recent researchers, uh, they just try to argue border are no longer. Uh, it, uh, sorry, uh, I, okay, okay, okay. Now it was sorry. Uh, it's argued that borders are no longer used to uh, clearly define the uh, state territories, and at the same time, uh, some uh, researchers argue we 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 need to take a position, so called the, the border uh, border thinking. It's try to argue the positionality of uh, 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 of borders should not be subjected to that of the state, uh, because in the past the state usually is taken as the res respons responsible for setting up the order of the core periphery. That's the order. Uh, that's the border. So instead of uh, taking the borders, the state-centric construction. The concept of border work is proposed by uh, uh, Christopher uh, Rumford. Uh, he, he tried to argue the concept of border work should recognize the ability of olden people, ordinary people, to construct borders without necessarily acknowledging the meanings delineated by the state. So, okay, in and follow follow the concept. I I try to. Uh, talk about the case study, particularly we will focus on later development of the the uh, the Kinmen, Kinmen and Mazu Island. So the first part is uh, the from the uh, forty nine to uh, fifty eight is is about the uh, birth of the the islands because uh, the uncertainty around the defeated KMT uh, regime during the civil war against the communists in nineteen forty nine. So at that, at that time, the attitude of the U.S. basically is on the one hand, the, the U.S. wanted, waited for the communist response for the formal diplomatic relation. On the other hand, the U.S. also supported the, the power comp competitor against the Chiang Kai-she in KMT. And also at that time, the U.S. also support so-called Taiwan independence movement. So, but because of the, the birth of, of Korea War, the seventh fleet of the, the U.S. might not de you know, determine to jointly protect Taiwan from the invention of the communist China. So, so uh, some scholars call it the, the shaping of the accidental state. At that time, so so here you you will see the map. Let's the uh, the the left side. That's the mainland China. Let's uh, is PRC, and this side is Taiwan. With the formal name is uh, ROC Republic of China, and uh, and uh, and you will see these two small island. It is that's the Mazu Island, and this one is Kinmen. You 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 will see. It's, it's located closer to mainland than to Taiwan, but at that time it was occupied by by Taiwan, uh, by Taiwan, Tai, uh, by Chiang Kai She's military. Okay, so at that time military conflict in Kinmen and uh, the the Gu uh, Lintou what battle to stop the communist Sicilian victory in in the civil war. So. And that time, uh, uh, including the Mazu, it, actually the Mazu is 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 cons consisted of uh, five separated 
administrative island. And after the sleep, the uh, after the KMT retreated to Taiwan, the five separate small islands co combined together, they become a new administrative unit. It's called Lianjiang County. So that means in the past, the Mazua is, is long, is not, it, it's been, this is five separate small islands belongs to different counties. But after that, it's become a new, give a new identity, it's called Lianjiang County. So, and that, that time the Mazu Island become the, the front line borderland from the uh, Fisher, uh, fish, Fisher uh, village. And the Mazu people are, not, are no longer allowed to go fishing. You know, after after the the uh, uh, after 1949. Uh, so, uh, so as the artillery war in uh, fifty eight is the peak of the heart of war uh, between Taiwan between ROC and the PRC. Okay, and uh, and after uh, fifty eight. The the island become uh, we I try to argue it's become a so called military militarized uh, a subject. At the time, so called war zone administration was established in Kinmen and Maju, and uh, abbreviated to Kinma, uh, respectively in 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 forty nine to command. Uh, uh, in for, in in fifty four to command and militarize. The governance of a popular sector. So, like at the time, we call it a compact village. The the popular sector should to join the military training for a certain period, and even women was not exceptional. So, and but at the time, Taiwan Taiwan government, the ROC government, still increased the size of troop in the off, offshore Kima, and the once reached uh, one fifty. Uh, Southern Army, about one quarter of the whole Taiwan military body. So at that time, the the Gima, Gima, uh, these these two islands, these two islands, is rely on the compact compact economy very 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 well. So you see, let's the. So, but but at the same time, the right so called the rise post war of economic miracle uh, in Taiwan after the 60s industrialization, Taiwan took advantage, took advantage of so-called inter new international division of labor and to engage in, in industrialization. So, and at the time, the geo geoeconomic, uh, uh, you know, Taiwan and the, so, as well as Korea was inserted into the geoeconomic networks driven by the US firm. So, and, and now I, I will talk about the, from the 87, because uh, Taiwan lifted, lifted the martial law in uh, 80, 80, 87. So it's changed. So it's called the democratization movement is occurred in Taiwan. And uh, Taiwan now engages so-called in, in, indigenization policy. That means we try to, uh, uh, try to construct a sense of destiny, community, distinguished from the old Chinese identity. At the time, then uh, President Li Denghui tried to propose a new Taiwan, Taiwanese uh, identity, you know, in contrast to the old Chinese identity. So, so that time, uh, the the army uh, the demilitarized. You know, occurred uh, in 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 uh, Gimma. and the cut of army garrison started in the early eighties. Uh, okay, so the the number you know uh, declined from the uh, one fifty thousand in peak to less than uh, fifty thousand in early two thousand and and so the compact economy declined. And in response, the, the government opened the Gima for so-called tour, tourist industry in, in 93 to in, encourage uh, 
uh, people from mainland Ta uh, from Taiwan to visit uh, Gimel Mazu. But but you know the economy is still very very bad at the time. So so uh, and uh, because of the you know the the relation between Taiwan and the uh, uh, PRC at the time you know uh, and uh, uh, get uh, smooth and so and and also uh, mainland China engaged in so called economic reform. So now. Uh, uh, the the coast area between in, in mainland China and and the, these two islands they start to engage the so called small amount uh, commodities trade between uh, Gimma and Fujian and uh, some of them are so are illegal according to uh, the law so so uh, but after two thousand uh, I I try to argue it's become a so-called developmental uh, border work. It's because uh, after 2000, the, the, uh, at that time, the DPP won the presidential election in 2000. And it's determined to strengthen so-called Taiwan identity. Some people believe the so-called Taiwan identity is related to Taiwan independent movement. So, uh, and, but that time, the government, the local government in Gimma, they try to, you know, find their way, their own way, and they try to. So the local government they try to sign agreement, uh, for cross trade exchange, but most of the uh, uh, agreement was threatened to be punished by the DPP central government. So, and. But in response, the government allowed the so-called three small links, and it illegalized the small amount of commodity trade between Kimma and the PRC. And also it, it okay. So uh, it means the Kimma becomes the spa spaces of exception to interface between Taiwan and the PRC. So, and the tourists from the PRC were allowed to visit Kimma only at that moment. Okay, and, uh, and also at the time, a number of exper experimental zone projects was proposed by the Kimma government. You can see a lot of, also a lot of zones was opened in, 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 uh, in the coast area uh, in mainland China. And, and the Gim, Gim and Maju, they, they want to respond to this and they propose, they propose like a duty-free island, it's business tax waiver. And also they try to propose cross-trade free trade zone in these two small islands. They, they, but this proposal, proposal was reluctantly supported by the central government. And, but it in, in, enhanced the bargaining power of the of Gim and Maju local government. So, uh, and, and, and actually, on, most of the proposal was, uh, uh, did not succeed, but only one uh, is, is more, uh, you know, achieve more uh, successful uh, result is the, uh, because it is the case of cross-trade submarine, wa submarine water supply pipeline. Uh, you will see, sorry, uh, that's in Chinese. There, there will, will be a, a, a pine is 16, 16 kilometers uh, between, uh, you know, sub, submarine uh, uh, from uh, mainland and to, to, uh, to Gimmen. Okay, because Gimmen have sh shortage of, of water and uh, they, they always want to, uh, in, uh, to import water purchased water from the mainland China uh, almost 20 years ago. They propose, proposed to the central government, but were rejected. But finally, it was uh, uh, allowed to do that in, uh, in, 19, uh, in 2015. So, so the, the in, you, you will see the infrastructure was con constructed and, but, and, oh, and, and it's completed in uh, 2018. But the government, the, the Chai Yingwen government, uh, 
reluctant to, to accept it because, because it, it's against the so-called one China policy. So, uh, so but finally, the, the water comes to, from mainland and to, to Gimmen, you know, because the local government insists and the local people support it. It's, it's, it's clo closely related to the everyday life of the local people in, in Gimmen. So you find that the water finally come out. Yeah. So my conclusion is, uh, I try to argue the border work is very much the business of Gimmen border agents, such as the local government and the ordinary people. So they, in, they involved in the constructing and the contesting borders. And the Kinmen border region is, is, is gained the momentum in the geopolitics of development in the process. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's my, 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 my presentation. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. Well, the concept of the uh, board, uh, developmental border work he suggested is uh, quite intriguing. Okay, uh, let's uh, go to the, uh, the second presentation by Takashi Yamazaki. Uh, his title is uh, Inter-Island Borderality Territoriality in East Asia from a Japanese Perspective. Takashi, please. Okay. Uh, let me share the, let's see. Can you see? Okay, yes. can you see? Yes. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, okay, hello, uh, everyone. Um, uh, before starting my presentation, I would like to uh, thank uh, you and uh, Research Institute of uh, Social Development and the Korean organizers very much for giving me this wonderful uh, opportunity to participate in this session. It is quite an honor for me to be here today. So um, as shown in this title, uh, my presentation is about inter-island modality, territoriality in East Asia, eliminated by, uh, from a uh, Japanese uh, perspective. <clears throat> When we talk about borders, uh, we assume a border space, which we may call territory. Uh, one, uh, our uh, act of making and using territory is called human territoriality. And human territoriality, according to SAC, can be defined as the attempt by an individual or a group to affect, influence, or control people, phenomena, and uh, relationship by delimiting and asserting control over a geographic area. Territoriality is complemented by borders as a way of communicating that there is territory under control. Territoriality also has an ideological effect to reproduce a particular value system or worldview uh, within territory. So modern state territory has been closely connected to sovereignty as their exclusive governing rights and understood as a basis for an exercise of sovereignty. Although state territoriality has a European origin, it has become an international norm since the 17th century. So East Asia was incorporated into this interstate system through colonization by and the decolonization from Western powers in Japan. Like territoriality in general, state territoriality has an ideological effect called the territorial trap. According to uh, Amihat Shari and, and Girard, uh, Giro, uh, modality indicates any technology of social spatial division or the governmentality of territorial limits. By analogy with the territoriality of any space, they argue that modality concerns what makes a border within a, a given space from a functional and a symbolic point of view. Given that territoriality is exercised through border control, modality needs to be beyond a mere analogy of territoriality. The territorial and empirical uh, interrelationship uh, between modality and territoriality should be explored. 
As Wilson and Donan indicate, the theorization of border studies is based mostly on experiences in Europe and North America. On the other hand, individual border case studies tend to lack theorization. Passy argues that existing theoretical arguments need to be contextually reflected and reshaped instead of merely repeating them in different contexts. Thus, in an empirical and theoretical sense, a regional or supra-transnational perspective would be necessary to illuminate how borders work in East Asia. Unlike Europe and North America, maritime borders surrounding littoral and archipelagic states in East Asia have played an uh, essential role in shaping international relations and the people's daily lives. Such geographical settings need to be taken into account to understand East Asia's territorialities and modalities as Chen demonstrates. From this perspective, my presentation focuses on the two groups of islands, the Okinawa Islands and Ishigaki Islands here in the Ryukyu Island chain. As a geopolitical context that have affected the territorialities of state and regions in the East China Sea region, I can point out three interrelated contexts. The legacy, survival of the Cold War, continuing heavy US military presence on Okinawa Island and so-called China's rise. Such geopolitical contexts have significantly affected the Japanese government's perspective on China's military buildup. The recent white paper of the Ministry of Defense of Japan describes the East China Sea with the phrases, China's attempt to change the status quo in East China Sea and China's rapid expansion and increase of military activities and expresses the Pacific Ocean with the phrase, active advancement to the Pacific Ocean by China. The territory of an archipelagic state is inherently porous and not contiguous. Does this physical environment determine its security risks and policies as an ontological given? One of such security risks has been centering on the territorial disputes over the Senkak, Diaoyu, Tiaoyu Tai Islands, which has become worse since 2010. The dispute can be characterized as one over non-use islands for potentially useful sea areas designated as EEZs. As illustrated in these overlapping or conflicting zones. However, such geopolitical territorial review cannot reveal the local realities. While the Ryukyu Island chain is marginal to mainland Japan, there are center periphery relations within the chain. Okinawa Island has been urbanized and populated as the central island and its islanders tend to vote against the US military presence as shown in light and dark uh, green in this map. On the other hand, peripheral islands have been depopulated and politically economically marginalized and their islanders have cast more conservative vote as shown in yellow and orange in a map due in part to the territorial dispute. These inter-island political economic disparities have led to the demilitarization of the peripheral islands areas through the relocation of US bases and the construction of new Japan's self-defense forces bases. These are a political choice made by their islanders 
for anticipated regional development at the expense of a possibility of being attacked by China. How can we shift the territorial view mentioned above to create a new paradigm for peace, not conflict, in the region? I'd like to propose a new ontology and epistemology called inter-island modality and territoriality. One of the main components of this perspective is multi-directionality. In the East China Sea region, there are neighboring others in multi directions. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, this locational nature of islands had made the Okinawa and Sakishima Islands the crossroads of inbound cruising tourists from Taiwan and China and Japanese domestic tourists by air. The second component is geohistorical liminality. Border islands typically constitute a time space of transition and often create a zone of colonial, post-colonial legacies of constant change. In this topology, islanders' identities are neither fully territorialized nor nationalized, which is what liminality means. The Ryukyu island chain is not an exception. So de facto state borders over the chain have been shifting since the early 17th century as shown with yellow dotted lines in this map. The third component is translocality. There are long-term translocal relationships such as sister city exchanges between islands in Okinawa and the coastal cities in China and Taiwan. As interstate relations are tensed in the region, it can negatively affect those relationships as seen recently between Ishigaki City in Okinawa and the Suao Township in Taiwan, shown in yellow in the map. Suao, however, gave support to Ishigaki during the spread of COVID-19 in the island and still wishes to continue their sister city exchange. So we do not have to assume that the state level antagonism would supersede translocal inter-island friendship. In conclusion, given the current standing of border studies, their further contextualization is necessary to construct a regional paradigm for parts of the world other than Europe and North America. In East Asia, Rather than an abstract notion of territory, an ontology and epistemology of archipelago and its relationship to mainland can help understand the geopolitical and the geoeconomic dynamisms of the region and hopefully create an alternative view to classical, realist, and state centric geopolitics. I hope my presentation can give you some insight into the discussion of this session and the conference as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Well, he suggested a regional paradigm and the, um, and it show the, uh, the relationship between um, border, borderity and territoriality, um, talking about the uh, inter-island dynamics. Thank you so much. Okay, um, and he was uh, very on time. <laughs> All right, the third presenter is uh, Seung Wook Lee from Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. And then his title is Seeing Like a Border Towards an Agenda for Border Studies in the Korean Peninsula. Seung Wook, are you ready? Please. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. As introduced, I'm Seung Wook Lee from KAIST. Thank you very much for inviting me to this conference. And it is my great pleasure and honor to speak along with the four, the other four Korean and international experts in East Asia. My organization has been working on activities on borderlines and borderlands, as you may well know. The border 
lines between the two Koreas have been closed to the largest extent, and it is the most heavily, dim, uh, heavily militarized space, and it is the only Korean Peninsula is the only place that has divided countries. As you can see on the left hand side, the borderland is within the firing range of North Korea. So it is very important that we do the hard work to protect these areas. That is why also the army is just stationed there and it has very important meaning in terms of security. Recent, in recent years, due to geopolitical situations, as you can see at the bottom of the right hand side, there is there are more military bases located. The security and insecurity are the characters of these areas. These areas can be characterized by the level of security. And this is also the homeland for uh, some politicians who argue for stronger security systems. And as you can see on the map, these areas are also full of military bases and military facilities. As of 2018, in Gangwon and Gyeonggi provinces, more than 10% of their areas are military facilities. And these are defining the identities of the areas. And these areas can be also characterized by tank barriers. And this, these are the pictures of Paju City. And you can see the tank barriers scattered around Paju City. And there is a tank barrier that is as old as uh, that was made back in uh, the Korean War. And as you were able to see on the pictures, there are areas that should be should not be the subject of limitation of economic development. So in 2011, the government announced a special act on support for border areas. And the special act stipulates the purposes, which is the purpose of this act is to create new growth engines, support the improvement of the welfare of the residents, and contribute to strengthening national competitiveness and balance national development. Specifically, which are the border areas, and the special act offers the definitions. Basically, the term border area means she's and guns abutting the demilitarized zone established in accordance with the military armistice agreement. And it is they are designated by the presidential decree based on the distance from the civilian line. As you can see, the light blue, light green areas, the yellow areas, they are the borderline areas. So practically, in reality, the borderlands and border areas have geopolitical and geoeconomical characteristics, and they are not free from influence, geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, influences. In, early to, in the early 2000s, Korea has a new president, and that was the moment when the inter-Korean relationships have shifted dramatically. And this was the start and beginning of the shift in geopolitical and economic ups and downs. And in 2007, the second inter-Korean summit was held, and that pushed and accelerated the geopolitical and economic changes of the Korean Peninsula. For example, the two Koreas agreed to a project, joint project for Korean train crossing. Mm -hmm the two Koreas. But there was a threat as well. In 2008, a new government was launched, which was very conservative. And there was this tragic accident that one of the North Korean workers were killed in Kaesong Industrial Park. That led to the closure of the Korean industrial complex in, located in North Korea. And there, that has have been followed by more developments of the two Koreas. And in 2018, there was a huge a shift made across the borders. And many people are many people expected they will bring another shift in geopolitical and economic situations. As a result of the agreement on Panmunjom, 
there was movement to resume the inter-Korean roads and railways projects. The, from the geopolitical and economic perspective, as well as from geopol uh, other perspectives, there was a very meaningful uh, incident. And in 2019, rejoining was proposed. The military conflicts should be stopped, and both Koreas agreed to that. And inter-Korean relations or cooperation used to focus on geopolitical situations, but since 2018, in 2018 and onwards, that shifted to geopolitical situations as well. So our view for the borderlands and border areas have been changed, and the borderland can be can serve as a hub for inter-Korean relations. In 2011, the Special Act was proposed and enacted, and the South Korean government announced a comprehensive development plan. Under the plan, the borderland will be made as an eco peace belt. Back then, the conservative government, Lee myung administration, proposed the Special Act. So as a result, it has inherent limitation. As you can see in the slide, the borderland is a place for inter-Korean economic cooperation, but at the same time, it is a front line of military tension. And the visions have been have not been supported by the economic cooperation between the two Koreas. So borderlands between the two Koreas has been understood as a place for ecological value. So compared to the movement in 20, 2010, the changes after 2018 have new meaning. For example, in 2019, the special act was revised. So by 2030, the government decided to invest one, uh, 16 billion won to develop the areas, and SOC will be expanded, and the balanced development strategies will be implemented there. That was the part of the provisions under the special revised special act. So along with the plan, there was argument to ease and remove the protected areas, and that was the signs of new changes made to the borderlands. And these changes and shifts have been in consistency with the geopolitical changes, as you may well know, in the last, the latest inter-Korean summits. The two Korea's leaders made suggestions, and Moon Jae, President Moon Jae-in suggested this new economic belt. Let's take a look at the picture on the left-hand side. It was a 20. 18 and the right hand side picture was proposed after 2018. The left picture only focuses on South Korea, but the right picture focuses on the overall Korean Peninsula. The vision itself covers the east, west, and south of the Korean Peninsula, and it stipulates a separate visions for each area. And it not just focuses on the Korean Peninsula, but focuses on the Eurasia region. So it is a more uh, greater vision. This is, the regional vision is not something new. As you know, the former President Park Geun-hye suggested Eurasia vision, which is very similar to the vision I've just described. But these visions, I'm not sure whether uh, resulted in a uh, tangible cooperation between the two countries. For example, President Moon Jae-in designated special uh, proposed a plan to designate a special unification economic zone and that will facilitate cooperation, economic cooperation between North Korea and small businesses in South Korea. This is not something new either. Special Jones have been repeatedly proposed by both Koreas. If you look at the right-hand side, there has been an 
a proposal to develop the borderland as a hub for economic activities. And a place in Paju is a good example. The Park Jung of the ruling Democratic Party of Korea said there is this potential for the border regions. I'm sorry that the, the article is written in Korean, so, and, but it's talking about the borderland is central to unification on the Korean Peninsula. So you, these stories show that there is this movement to uh, reshuffle activities on the borderland. And Paju is getting ready for reunification, unification, and Cholon is another place that hopes for unification. And these places and cities are branding themselves as a place for unification on the Korean Peninsula. And residents in these cities are yearning for reunification as well. And there are still geopolitical visions left. And professor of the Seoul National University, this professor made this column, this story, and he said, DMZ identifies the difference between the modern era and the medieval era. And borderland has this meaning and value. But this, personally, I think, is an orientalistic view. And the former president, US President Trump, when he addressed the Korean National Assembly, he said, DMZ is the thin line of civilization that runs around the world. So in summary, various visions have been proposed for the borderland. The borderland has been viewed as a geopolitical front line and marginalized periphery. And in recent years, borderline in Korea has been viewed as a wildlife sanctuary and nature preserve, and as well as the front line of civilization. But there are some things common here. They are reduced as an object of development plan, especially the central government's development plan or desire. And these approaches have been witnessed in the academic circle and community. This is an example. This is a research of borderlands in Korea. If you look at the right-hand side, you can see, according to the graph, the number of researches on borderlands in Korea is increasing. And social science is the major area that uh, studies the borderland activities. And natural science is the second best. So in summary, most of the researchers take this approach focusing on local development, especially tourism. And we've seen changes in the political community and academic community. So new visions and new views have been introduced. And those new views have a meaning in that they are seeing the borderland as a place with new values like ecological preservation. So we have to go beyond the development-centered paradigm, and we have to start seeing the borderland in Korea as an important place from geopolitical and geoeconomical perspective. So due to time constraint, I'm going to speed up. So by seeing lack of border, what I meant was very similar to seeing like a city, which means a recogni which means recognizing that cities are living things made of entangled networks of bodies, symbols, technology, and infrastructure. So we have to take the same approach when we discuss the borderland in on the Korean Peninsula. And borderland is changing fast. There is a good example in Korea. The borderland in Korea has experienced the housing price going up very rapidly. It also it is also a sign of a, another type of desire. 
And due to the African swine fever outbreak, the borderland has been covered with blood. And this is an example of contaminated or polluted borderlands. So these are new types of borderlands image. So what I want to say, my point is, that the central government's visions and local government's awareness should be combined and integrated. And development, environment, and peace nexus can vary depending on where they happen and depending on the government's visions and plans. Lastly, this is my conclusion. So all in all, borders should not be treated only by the government, especially the central government's visions. There is a mixture of cultures and different societies and different ecology. I think I overran my presentation time. So, um, here discussed uh, the security development ecology nexus yeah, and the various aspects of border, border areas in the Korean Peninsula. That was great. Okay, our last presenter is uh, Baekhyun Park uh, from Seoul National University. And his title today is the role of local forces and the translocal networks for the development of a peaceful geopolitical economies in the East Asian border regions. 네, 반갑습니다. 방금 소개 받은 박배균입니다. 어, 이제까 이번 세션에서 들어보셨겠지만 어, 그 발표한 논문들이 전부 똑같이 어, 동아시아의 평화와 어떤 그 지속 가능한 발전을 추구함에 있어서 어, 지역 또 로컬 행위자들의 역할과 중요성을 강조하는 그런 발표들이 많았는데요. 저도 그런 차원에서 그럼 저는 좀더 구체적이고 실천적인 차원에서 이 로컬 행위자들이 어떤 역할을 So let me tell you how we can play that role in uh, more directly. So in terms of the peace building, we have this traditional approach, which is led by the center government, the relations between the center governments and nations and how they see their territories and how they want to protect their territories in terms of the security. So at a larger scale than the nations, they also pay attention to the uh, larger, uh, like a multi scales. However, as was mentioned before in this session, the presentations shared a focus on the local rather than the nation or uh, center government level. They focus on the local actors and their powers and their influences. And in terms of the um, context of the borderlands, why the local actors play an important role and what kind of roles that they can play will be uh, what I'm going to highlight in my presentation. First off, um, in terms of the theological approach will be the post-territorialization. Um, let me tell you how we should divide the borders and the territories. Borders or territories, a traditional approach shows that a border is a line dividing two countries. And based on the um, territories, they look at the borders. However, the post-territorialist approach shows that a border is not a closed concept. It has a high level of porosity. And also, in terms of the borders and territories, there are a very multifaceted aspects. And there are many other non-government actors involved in this argument. And also, border has a network in nature. So in terms of the territorial sovereignty, we, we don't have this exclusive territory. But inside the border, there is um, porosity. So due to the porosity, there are many different spaces. And they are connected as a network. And they have many um, archipelago, which has like high level of porosity. And on this sense, in terms of looking at the borders, 
rather than applying a linear theory or logic, we need to take a look at it from a nonlinear perspective. In this sense, how we should see a border, let's find it in more detail. The borderline or national border has this mobility and territoriality, so it's at a crossroad. So the territoriality and also there is an overlapping um, area of this mobility. It also goes like um, transnational movement and the flow that takes place at the borderlands. So there are different forces and there are the other forces that block this flow of movement and that's happening at the borderlands and the territorialization and the territorialization, how they interplay depending on their interplays. This borderlands can be a space of the conflict and tension or it can be a channel or a venue for communication and exchanges. And I will skip the slide due to time constraints. This diagram is about the traditional approach of borders in terms of the post-territorialization. What you see on the left is a traditional approach. A border is very rigid and inside and outside the border, it's clearly demarked. And what you see on the right, on the other hand, we have some lines, but there are some pores. It's a porous. And inside the border, there are many different actors inside and outside the border, and they interact on a continual basis, and they also keep creating other borders. So when you compare these two different diagrams, you can see the post-territorialization perspective. So given this, Um, especially um, on the, um, I want to talk about the role of the local actors in East Asia. And as was mentioned by another speaker from Taiwan, Professor Hu Jin Yu mentioned in his presentation, it is the case of the Kinma Islands of Taiwan, and we have the West Sea Five Islands in South Korea. And I want to compare these two different countries or uh, regions to tell you about the border work uh, and the local actors' roles. And the Kinma Islands, as the professor who just mentioned, well, as you can see on the map, they are closer to the mainland China than Taiwan, eight kilometers versus and 200 kilometers away from Taiwan. But they are a territory of Taiwan. And why this thing has happened? Well, the professor has already well described in his presentation, but uh, let's go through this history briefly. Um, during the war, the People's Party uh, was defeated, and they had to go through the Ch Kinma Islands. And these Kinma Islands, in October 2049, the People's Party and the Communist Party had the battle. And the party, I mean, as a joke, uh, by mistake, they won this battle, and the Communist Party could not make any further advancement, so they had to withdraw. And right after that, the Korean War broke out, and that has become just the um, uh, border line. However, before that, the Kinma Islands, um, the Fujian, and the borderland were very closely related to this um, island, and they were sharing their um, region, and there was a large seaborne trade, and they served as a channel for this seaborne trade. And with this seaborne trade, they could have a lot of uh, economic gains. However, as I mentioned, in t 1949, we had this, like, um, uh, event and they has become a territory of Taiwan and the Kinma Islands and the, between the shaman they have they, they came to have this uh, borderline but before then on the Kinma Islands they dependent on these islands and they were separated and they were marginalized and they had to go through many economic difficulties and not just economic difficulties but during this time a lot of military tensions and conflicts 
were um, concentrated on this region. Since the late 1950s and for like 20 years from China, they had these military tensions and conflicts um, were there and these whole tensions were escalating over the years. So they have become a uh, military power took uh, power in the country, but they started to see some changes. And since after the 1979, they started to see some changes in terms of the demilitarization. And um, China and the U.S. normalized their diplomatic ties. And after that, China over the Chinman Kinma Island, they stopped this battle. And the military tensions between Taiwan and the mainland has went down. And across Taiwan, they had this democratic movement in 1987. And as a part of this uh, democratic movement, they had this martial art lifted. However, Kinma Islands, although they were, uh, because they were on this front line, the martial law was still there. And to fight against it, the local government or local people um, implemented a lot of this um, democratic movement. And in 1992, from this Kinma Island, the martial uh, law was um, lifted and they started to demilitarize. And a few years later, they had another de-territorializing forces. So this is more um, thing, uh, they have like three things. So in a small scale between Taiwan and China, they may not be able to do that uh, country-wise, but with some islands of like uh, Majo and the Fujian Island. And in some regions, the mail delivery and the flow or movement of goods. And there's one more thing, I forgot that, but these three things were allowed to pass freely between these two regions. And there was a new measure. And that was started in 2001. And with the Kinma Islands, they have become um, to experience this uh, the territorialization, and one thing I want to highlight here in comparison to this case is the five islands in West Sea in Korea. They are very similar to the Skinma Islands, and they are far from the mainland of Korea and very close to North Korea. And in these islands, NNL and other maritime lines are effective. And around this NNL, there are severe conflicts. And since 1970s, North Korea uh, denied this NLL. And they started to create a lot of um, or some different tensions. However, here, not just the territorial logic apply, but there are many different deterritorialization de um, took place. Geohistorical, uh, historically, they shared the living space. So they had this force in play. And the other thing is, as an actor of the deterritorialization, we had this um, fishing resources, fishing stocks. It doesn't matter whether the territory or the border line is there, and they can move freely, and the fishers also were involved. I mean, they didn't intend it to that, but they had um, these deterritorialization actions. And North Korea kidnapped some fishers in the 70s and 80s, and that was what was happening um, in the process of following or catching the fishes. And as a result, uh, between North and South Korea, there were many discussions taking place on deterritorialization. Um, it was to build like a mutual fishing zones, which started in 1982. And also we had this special zone for West um, Sea Peace and Cooperation in 2007, President Roh Moo-hyun and North Korean leader Kim Jong-il had this discussion or negotiation. However, as you all know, after that in 2008, we had this regime change or leadership change, and we had this North Korean nuclear crisis escalating and all this discussion and efforts on the territorialization has become um, fruitless. And we are still having this um, escalating military tension. Um, 
I compare these two different cases not just to tell you about the historical facts, but these Kinmen Islands and Western Islands, how we can identify the differences between the two cases. These two regions, in identifying their differences, uh, we need to take it from like a macro level, geopolitical and geoeconomic level. They have some differences. For the Kinmen Islands, for example, after the opening of China, the diplomatic ties between the U.S. and China was normalized, and that had a huge impact, and the Chinese economy has grown a lot. So with the surrounding um, conditions um, changing, that led to uh, changes uh, in this region as well. However, for this West C5 islands in Korea, we are having this national division, and there are some remnants and conflicts coming from this Cold War. That's what we have. So the um, so deterritorialization hasn't really have impact, but that's not all. As I mentioned before, at a macro level, there are other geopolitical factors, and many people have mentioned on this, so I will not cover that. But I want to highlight here, uh, there are some differences in terms of the local conditions. For the Kinman Island, they had more than 100,000 in population, so they have a large population. But for the West Sea Five Islands, all combined, they have um, a population of less than 15,000. So population is a big difference. And also for the Kinman Islands, it has a bigger population, and they have a strong economic base, and they have a very famous for their liquor product. So they are really prospering in terms of the economy. So the center government, they are less dependent on the center government. And the other thing is this Kinman Islands, unlike this uh, mainland or Taiwan, uh, Taiwan, they didn't have this colonial experience by Japan, so they have different identities from the mainland. So as I mentioned before, in the late 80s, they resisted against the militarization, and also they had this uh, democratic movement, which explains why they um, worked on this. And as Professor Fu mentioned, the Kinman Islands and China had many uh, smuggling between these two countries, and it was hard for them to punish all these smuggling trades. And these three passage policies um, was triggered by that change. However, for these West Sea Five Islands, they have smaller population, and they have a very weak base for the economic development. So from the local central government, they had to get a lot of support. So at a local level, their autonomy or the voices of the local residents were not really heard. And these are the differences. Well, the West Sea Five Islands, I've been there many times. But when you go there, the residents don't want people to look at them as a place for military tensions. They don't want to hear about it because that blocks the flow of the tourists. They so in other words, the borderlands and the local residents, how they see themselves um, is really different from how we see them at a national level. So these identities, marginalized identities and marginalized perspectives are what we need to um, think more carefully. Why my slides are not really moving? Okay, so it's working now. So given this, in promoting peace in East Asia, how we can promote the local initiatives, this is the borderlands and the cities in the region connected. We have many such cities in Korea. We have inter-Korean borderlands and Jeju, Okinawa in Japan and Chin Kinman and Maju in Taiwan. So these borderland cities, as I mentioned before, they have a very unique characteristics, the territoriality and mobility. There is an overlaying space, and they have this violence and the memories of the ideological conflicts from the Cold War. So they have very unique nature, and they have to leverage 
these unique stories and their sorrows and the pains from their um, memories and they can build a network. So this is what I want to propose, which is to build an East Asian peace city network. And uh, by linking this into local and the urban cities, we can have a network for peace city. And in this peace city, we can have uh, many discussion and linking all the cities and towns and counties led by the local actors, experts, scholars, local NGO activists, and the local government officials, politicians, business businessmen, and residents will be the leading actors of this network. And also inside the network, you will be an epistemic community. That's a vision for this network. And the key here, because the local actors uh, don't have these diplomatic powers, so they will not be able to make any convention or treaty or signing to these treaties. However, they can play an important role and which will be to build epistemic community for mutual learning and knowledge sharing and having common framework for the issues. And also they can propose very specific solutions to build peace. That's the role that they can play in the region. And these actors, what they will learn and share, well, at a local level, they can promote this de-territorial argument and discussion, and they don't need to really deal with actual security or safety issues. It's about the towns and communities. They can have like a more inclusive and eco-friendly place, and that will be a foundation for building permanent peace in the region. So at a city level and a local level, they can learn from each other. And by doing that, we can have sustainable peace and come up with uh, local solutions for experiments. And then by uh, led by these local actors, we can share their perspectives. And based on this, we can promote them into national um, projects and national achievements they can play in important roles. So, so to conclude, People often say that the peacemaking in the Korean Peninsula and East Asia, the multi approach is important, like the six-party talk. Uh, we need to come back to the table. Many people say that, and I understand that it's important as well. But this multilateral diplomacy needs to be expanded and also deepened. At a national level, uh, they will have limitations they may miss some elements that they cannot see at the national level. So at a local level as well, we need to work and work with and involve these local actors so that we can have more deeper and more dynamic um, changes and achievements of peace. And by doing this, we can open up a new window for the diplomat, um, the urban diplomacy. And uh, on this multifaceted and multilateral diplomatic framework, uh, and governance, we can have a peace on the Korean Peninsula. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. So, um, Baekhyun um, said that the border is porous and messy, and uh, he suggested that um, uh, the East Asian peace city networks, those local uh, initiatives can make the border more porous and messier in a positive way. Okay, um, now uh, we are going into the um, questions and answers. And uh, I believe that we have a wonderful questions um, already. And, um, and we have about uh, 30 minutes, okay? So let's go to the, uh, the first question first. Um, this is a, a okay. Let me re, read the question. What are the main reasons preventing sustainable and peaceful development in the East Asian borderlands? Um, well, I think uh, that uh, Takashi probably you can answer, but uh, uh, let me read uh, another question for you. Um, uh, 
Professor, uh, I wonder if we can bring out translocality in our sister cities. I don't know about Japan, but in Korea, sister cities tend to be an administrative event. The concept of a translocality is very interesting. So Takashi, probably you can talk about translocality and then this, uh, you know, the main reasons um, preventing sustainable and peaceful development in East Asia? Okay, uh, thank you very much for wonderful questions. Um, okay, I, I try to answer uh, the first one first. Um, I think there are uh, a couple of reasons for, for that. Uh, the biggest one is, you know, as, as you probably know, uh, the legacy and the survival of the Cold War, geopolitical reason. Um, the, the kind of uh, great power library now is shifting from uh, US Russia library to uh, uh, US China one, right? And then as well as uh, we also have um, North Korean issue and, you know, Taiwan problems, things like that. So these kind of things, uh, political, uh, geopolitical uh, uh, conditions uh, hinder uh, a better uh, peaceful relationship uh, built by um, partner countries. The second one is, uh, I think that, that, that second one can be solved. Uh, uh, through the effort of uh, partner countries. The second one is post-colonial matters uh, between countries, right? And th this matter uh, can easily be used politically by politicians in each country. <laughs> if they stop doing that, I think we can solve this problem. We can, we can reach mutual understanding about the past. Uh, and the third one is actually close uh, closely related to the, the first two, lack of mutual trust. And we need uh, trust building among, among us, right? Uh, these are geopolitical uh, uh, reasons, I think, um, working for this kind of uh, prevention of uh, peace building. And the second dimension is geoeconomics, right? And uh, East Asia is the price of uh, the highest you know, economic growth, one of the highest economic growth area in, in the world. And also we have a highly competitive economies and we compete each other, right? And at the same time, uh, we are very much, you know, closely uh, connected <laughs> with each other. So our economy is, is cannot be separated, you know, by country as a state, right? We, our economy, East Asian economy is closely, you know, connected to each other, right? So. Uh, this, you know, is, can be a possibility to build a better, you know, peaceful relationship among our, you know, uh, countries and, and uh, but th this, you know, economic, geoeconomic geo interrelations uh, create uh, environmental problems, right, to be uh, solved uh, through uh, mutual, you know, cooperation. Now, this is a big issue, environmental issue, is global warming and the air pollution and the ocean pollution, things like that. So we really need a uh, multilateral uh, regime to, to, to address this, this, this issue. So our, our set may be one you know, such device to, uh, for the coordination of uh, environmental or economic or political issues, right? And so that's why I think a regional uh, paradigm is, is now necessary to, to, to pay more attention to these you know, uh, transnational uh, issues. That, that's the question from, from me for the first, first question. Okay, so, so it, it, I, you know, other, other panelists may add something to it. So I, I can wait for uh, uh, moving to the second question. Sorry, uh, I was going to ask uh, uh, Sungook um, the, the first question as well, okay. uh, but uh, um, you have uh, another um, question, no, other two questions actually. Um, did you see this? Uh, okay, <laughs> it's, it's a long question. <laughs> and, um, and then there is, a, is, is another one. So um, maybe should you I, can- should I, ask, should I ask two questions, the second question now, or should I wait? Right. 
Uh, I think uh, Takashi, you can you can answer the second question first, and then I go to uh, Sungo. Okay. Okay. Yes. So um, regarding the second question, this is also a, a very good question. Um, well, if you look at uh, the Ryukyu Aran chain. And this is part of Japan, right? So uh, I, I don't know how compare this case with uh, the other case in Korean Peninsula, for example. Um, that, that's what I, I want to say. You know, we really have to contextualize, you know, the inter-island or within peninsula relationship, things like that. So we, we have to contextualize, you know, this, this type of issue. So regarding Japan, uh, I think, uh, municipality, local government may have some uh, 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 jurisdiction to promote inter-municipal uh, diplomacy with Taiwan and, and Ch China, as long as this may not uh, uh, sort of the, prevent the, the central government uh, intention and you know, to, to promote national diplomacy, right? So if the local government uh, has uh, discretion. That, I mean, you know, the the government local government system is decentralized enough to promote uh, local diplomacy. Uh, it is possible to create a better uh, uh, social economic relations with the other side of the border. In the case of uh, Japan, okay, um, and also we have to look at the border as an entity of multidimensional. You know, multidimensional is very important. And also in the case of uh, archipelago, the distance means the political distance to mainland is also uh, affecting the possibility of uh, uh, translocal uh, diplomacy. So uh, for the islanders, actually it's more beneficial to build uh, Transporter relationship with the other side of the border, Taiwan and the coast of China, rather than to mainland. So in that case, um, uh, as far as the the political uh, environment allows, uh, it's it's better to promote uh, translocal diplomacy with the other side of the border. Okay. Thank you, uh, Peigun. Would you like to add? Yes. Uh. 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 이제 한국말로 하겠습니다. 그... I will speak in Korean. So, Professor Takashi, thank you for the comment. And I want to add a few more comments to your um, answer. Yes, of course, at the current stage, these international and diplomatic works at the local government are not really substantial. They exchange as a sister cities, but they are more of a formality. They send the people and they do some exchange and study tour. They do some of the work, but they are not really substantial uh, in bringing any tangible progress. And as Takashi just mentioned, these diplomatic ties uh, or diplomatic power held by local governments are not enough. That's a good point. So we have to decentralize the local governments so that we can give more power to the local governments. And that is true. But there's one thing. But still, as I mentioned and presented on my um, Peace City Network, we have to build it as an epistemic um, network or community. Because even though they don't have a strong power at local governments, if they have a strong and closely knit epistemic community that can work, let go cities on the borderlands or the cities who want to be a part of the network, they can build this community and they can share their experiences and they can share their knowledge. And by doing that, they can further uh, make their cities more inclusive and more multifaceted and economic um, eco-friendly by sharing and learning from each other and they can have like a common framework of solving issues. And these, in this journey, they need to have, the, and that will mean a lot as much as this diplomatic power given to local governments. So building this epistemic 
community and local governments may not lead to immediate decentralization or giving the diplomatic power to local governments. But even without doing that, we can build this local community if our local actors have strong creativity and strong vision. I think uh, the audiences are also uh, thinking about uh, the roles of a local government, local governance, and then and the national government, uh, because a, a similar question comes to uh, Sungguk Lee. For example, um, do you think still the uh, national level politics is still main main factor? Yeah, and another question is about. Um, well, the, uh, the, the Border Corpor uh, Cooperation Initiative still focuses on connection with the continent. And then um, he said that, I personally think that it will be possible to create an agenda of promoting peace, starting from joint responses to China's fishing boat economic uh, advancement. Uh, and then also to Sung Lee, uh, what well, this question is about the residents, the local residents' lives in the uh, in the border area. So, um, would you like to respond? First of all, I'd like to answer the question first, which was asked by Yi Kyung Won. As Professor Park mentioned earlier, in two thousand seven, though. Western Sea Cooperation Zone, the idea was first introduced and it was going beyond the territorial boundary. So it was a very meaningful attempt, but it was weakened by political power. So it was very unfortunate to see that. But when such an attempt was collapsing due to the political intervention, but as other speakers or experts would say that we need to give more focus and attention to the bottom-up trials. In 2007, the idea of a Western Sea Cooperation Zone should be, uh, we should shed a new light on the idea of a Western Sea Cooperation Zone. I'm not saying national politics is the only thing that is important. I think everyone else would agree that at different scale power moves for example, in the borderlands in East Asia, the legacy of Cold War still remains. It, they are still powerful. And there are these structural problems in East Asia, borderlands. Such a structural power has a strong influence on the borderlands structure in East Asia. But if we focus on the two Koreas and the Korean Peninsula, every com everything comes second to national security. So desire and views and understanding and interests of the central government has override everything else. And in the process, the emotions and psychology of people have been ignored and overlooked. So we need to shed new light on those new views. And different people are living in different borderlands with different lifestyles and different perspectives. So we'd like, I'd like to suggest we have a more closer look at the different views. As the professor said earlier, we are not, we shouldn't try to change the view of these people, but we should at least open up our mind and share their views, try to understand them. We should move away from the central view and we should look at the edges more. So as a geologist, I think we can learn more by meeting with people and talking with them and learning about their lifestyles and daily routines. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, and then uh, one of the uh, pre-received uh, uh, questions can go to probably uh, Jin Yushu and then Baekhyun Park, because this is about local governance. How can the issue of a peacemaking in border areas have a relationship with, uh, with local governance? Uh, would you like to respond, Jin Yu? Okay, uh, I, I, I get, uh, give a quick response. Uh, I think border is 
always is the, the site of termination about the state building, about uh, sovereignty. Okay, but if we, in, you know, just confined in this idea, uh, I think no, no, the border will uh, cannot play any role and then and the local government in the border region cannot play any role no in the cross border exchange but if we change the, the view the border can can be interface it can be uh if we if we blow blow the board the the idea of uh, sovereignty so we can share some sovereignty in in the border region and then uh we we will have some exchange I think from the experience in Taiwan, in, in given Mazu, I think the, uh, we, in spite of up and downs in the cross-trade exchange, but I think that in the long term, the local government still have their voice, particular, particularly those issues closely related to the everyday life in the local, local you know, in, in, the, in the border region. So, I am up, up, optimist about the, the, the law of the local government played in, in the cross-border exchange. Yeah. Right. Uh, let me ask the same question uh, to Pei Gyun. And especially then, uh, what do you think about the, uh, the roles of a civil society or universities? And how about the national government when the, the cities have established this network? Ne, uh... Well, yes, indeed, at the borderlands, the actors, local actors, their roles need to be further highlighted and we need to listen closely to their voices. That's important. However, at the same time, on the local, um, in the local actors, their voices not, may not always be good or well intended. On the Korean Peninsula, when you look at the borderlands, in many cases, the local actors, their voices are mostly for development. Please um, scrap the regulations. We want to build infrastructure, buildings, industrial development. They have these desires for development in their voices. So in some sense, what we are talking about here, the peace and the sustainability, the sustainability part may not be well captured if we just uh, listen to their voices only. So we need to involve more diverse local actors. However, when you look at borderlands in the, on the Korean Peninsula, local actors' voices are mostly from these development uh, pursuers or the pro-development people, and their local voices are bigger than the others. But we should listen to different stakeholders and different local actors with different perspectives because the, uh, as a way to promote the democracy at the local level. And I think on the borderlands, in promoting the local governance, this will be a key uh, precondition. Right, there can be various, various um, actors. And then um, I would like to repeat my question about the uh, national government, because uh, I, I, I really like your idea uh, about the, um, the city, peace city um, networks. Uh, so when, when cities do that, East Asian cities do like a peace networks, uh, what would be a potential role of national government, do they would they watch and support? Yeah. Uh... Right. The central government, national government, their role historically, whether it's uh, developed countries or in East Asia or West European, like a welfare government, 
either of the cases, these governments were regulatory states in nature. But I think the regulatory states should change into enabling states because the enabling states, by that I mean the civil groups or civil society or the local initiatives need to be identified, captured, and supported by the center national government. That's the role that they have to play. That's the shift that they need to make as an enabling government or state from the regulatory state to an enabling state. This whole transition will not just about the governance in the borderlands, but it covers, I mean, with the COVID-19 and the public services and the public goods are now being an important part of our life. And people are now talking about the role of the welfare state from the regulatory state to an enabling state. So in this regard, I think in terms of the borderland governance, local actors, voices need to be heard and the center national government need to support and advocate the local initiatives. That's the role of the national government, I think. So uh, listening um, to you, uh, I'm getting really optimistic about this, uh, you know, sustainable and peaceful uh, development. But um, let me ask this uh, last question. So um, would you uh, think of any disabling factors like uh, uh, like the first question, what, what is the main reasons pre preventing preventing peaceful development? So, um, what would be a main reasons preventing uh, East Asia peace city networks development? Anybody? Because um, maybe going back to the as as you know others. Yes. Point out uh, maybe that going back to the the sort of the mentality of you know territorialization, right? And the, the classical geopolitical thought, mm. you know, the the state has territory, territory has to be protected, but that that, that doesn't work. <laughs> well, if you look at the periphery, you could the borderland, you know, in order to in order the, for borderland to develop, you know, we have to, you know, getting a little bit more and more away from this type of mentality of you know, territorialization. Mm. So that's one, one, one of the way for, for the future. So you know, we, we should we, move we on. We tend to go back to the past <laughs> too much sometimes. And the, the you know, national media promote mm. this type of you know, perception yes. of you know, border dispute, right? Right, so right. It affects the borderland, even though they had the chance to create you know, trans, local transporter you know, development with the, the other side of the border, mm. but they try to shut down, you know, the, the, the territory, our land kind of thing. So it's, it's, you know, partially important, you know, to, to protect yourself, but at the same time, you have to open yourself mm. to, you know, to build relationship to the other side. So we okay, are completely, so... you know, trapped, sometimes trapped <laughs> in this territorial trap. We should move on from this yeah, trap, yeah, should, classical geopolitical trap. Different vision of the world. <laughs> okay, great. Anybody else? Then the, what? What can? Um, uh, because it was one of the um, the pre-received questions. What is uh, the role of uh, ordinary people? Yeah. Uh, good. Yes, as Professor Takashi just mentioned, in international relations and peace building works, we have to move away from these traditional approaches centering on the states and the state, their own logics and the nations or nationalities and the trap of territory, not just the 
originally public, but the policymakers and also key leaders of political circle are now having this mindset and attitude as an underlying um, mindset. So at a local level, the local initiatives or Peace City Network establishment is now being hampered by this mindset. So nationalistic or state-oriented uh, perspective and the territory trap are what we need to overcome by making different efforts on many different um, fronts. Well, I think to overcome territorial trap, of course we can say that, but actions even matter more because specific actions and by turning that into something that's tangible so that people can see that there is a trap and we are trapped. And well, we have to address this territory trap and among the political geographic researchers, we know that for sure. However, rather than just repeating it, I think although we are not fully ready, I am proposing the idea of the Peace City Network as I hope that we want to have something tangible with a target and vision of this uh, network so that we can overcome and move beyond the territory trap and move on for the next step. So that was why I did that. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I, I really believe that uh, we had the um, like best, best uh, geopolitics scho uh, scholars in this session. And then, um, um, uh, uh, thank you so much for your presentations and the questions from the audiences. Uh, I think that the, uh, this session really provided local, you know, subnational uh, perspectives from the uh, uh, geopolitical, geoeconomic perspectives. Um, I, um, I think we, this debate can go on like, for more hours, but because of the uh, time limit, I think we have to finalize here. Thank you, everyone, so much for your participation. Thank and you, Takashi and Jin Thank you. Thank see, you very much. Yeah, Thank see you. you. See you soon. See you soon again. Okay. <laughs> so much, professors. Everyone, that was the special session two organized by the Center for Asian Urban Societies. In particular, I would like to thank Professor Heran Shin for moderating and all the other four presenters for their valuable participation. Moving on, we have session seven. That will be the closing session in a closing, uh, for the closing of the forum. It will be in a round table format and we'll take a little bit of a break before then. The closing session will start at 3 o'clock Korea Standard Time, uh, less than a half an hour from now. So why don't we take a little break and come back and see you again at 3 o'clock. Thank you very much. <laughs>